Hey guys, before we start this video, I want to give a big shout out to our gold tier patrons, Lucas, Abeat, Pyrite, and Ghostly Gaming. Thanks so much for your support, guys. Enjoy the video. Downloadable content is everywhere. It ranges from extra songs to your favorite rhythm game, to entire campaigns spanning tens of extra hours for your favorite RPG. Some DLC can give you new skins for your character, and some DLC can be a new weapon in an online game, giving you the edge over other players. But what makes a good DLC? My standards for what makes a good DLC are as follows. A good DLC is a piece of content that supplements the game. It is something that's being added onto the game, and not something that should have been in the game from the start. Metal Gear Survive was guilty of this, as they locked the ability to have multiple save files behind a paywall. Wall. Having various save files should be standard in any game, let alone a AAA release. Good DLC should expand the world and story of the original game along with the gameplay. A fantastic example of the right way to handle DLC is Infamous First Light. Infamous First Light is a standalone expansion for Infamous Second Son. If you want more context on Infamous Second Son, you can watch my analysis of it on my channel, which will be linked in the description. I will, however, quickly state my overall thoughts on Second Son. I'd also like to mention that this entire video will be my opinion, so if you don't like First Light, there's nothing wrong with that. Feel free to discuss why why you liked or didn't like it in the comments below. Second Son was an excellent game that improved on a lot of issues and answered a lot of requests that were present in the first two Infamous games. However, some aspects such as the Karma system were as dull as ever, and the story seemed to have taken a few steps back. Major criticisms included uninteresting characters, powers that felt underdeveloped, not enough diversity within those powers, and a lack of fun side quests. Now these criticisms don't mean that the game isn't a spectacular game made with love and care, but there were a few things that could have been done better. Since this DLC took me about four hours to complete, I'll say it now, if you haven't played Infamous First Light and have played Second Son and enjoyed it, buy First Light. It's well worth your time as everything from the story to its characters to its powers have seen revisions and improvements that make it in my eyes the perfect DLC. Since this DLC is about two to three hours long, I have to clarify that there will be spoilers littered all over this video. Even the footage on screen so far should be considered spoiler territory as the gameplay is really where this game will be the most enjoyable. However, I must admit the story is also much better this time around. So consider this your warning that there will be spoilers ahead. Now, I'm going to do something similar to the Second Son video, where I'll split the video up into different parts, which would in this case be presentation, gameplay, and story. So why don't we start with the presentation? As far as graphics and textures go, everything is the same as the last time you saw it. Certain textures have been reworked, such as the vents in Seattle. In Second Son, the vents in Seattle were red and had a yellow light so that they were easy to spot, and I believe this was by design. But here, they blend into the environment much more, since, like Fetch, you'll be sticking purely with neon. Seattle itself is almost the same as it was in Second Son, however, for this DLC, the downtown districts are locked off. I have a theory as to why. Fetch moves much faster in this game, and I think because she moves so fast, having the full open world and having aspects of that open world loading so quickly might negatively impact the frame rate, which is more stable this time around. I would also assume that reworking downtown would take a lot of resources, and Sucker Punch may have just decided it wasn't worth it. Thankfully, the story doesn't mention downtown, and you never have a huge desire to go there. You do, however, get to go to some new areas throughout the story, which includes the DUP facility alluded to in Second Son, Kurt and K. Here, you'll be introduced to three different training facilities that feel similar while having their quirks. The first is the Alpha Arena, which feels like a reconstructed city block with lots of square scaffolding, allowing you to feel like you'd be training in Seattle. This is unfortunate by the fact that all the enemies that are generated here are drug dealers. You may have noticed I said the enemies are generated. That's right, these guys are just holograms, which, fun fact, are conjured up by another conduit named Eugene, who you would have met in Second Son. If you know anything about Fetch from Second Son, then you'll know that she blames the death of her brother on drugs and drug dealers, which allows the drug dealer holograms to make more sense here, as Augustine would use the drug dealer holograms to motivate Fetch to train. Not bad. Not great. But you just started. Perhaps you'd like more relatable targets. The second is the Beta Arena, which is much more like an arena as it has an octagonal layout and introduces some more challenging elements, like turrets and harder DUP enemies. A few miniboss enemies are thrown at you here too. The third and final arena, called Gamma Arena, is a similar design to the Beta Arena, but everything is more extensive, and there's more space to move. The enemies conjured here can range from drones that shoot you to hardy DUP agents, and miniboss enemies will be commonplace. These arenas are all fun for different reasons, but I'll talk about them more later. While the world and the new stages are well designed and fun, the first thing you probably notice about this DLC is the look of Neon. The Neon Dash, an ability you'll use for the entirety of your playthrough, has a more fluorescent and particle-heavy design than the Lightspeed Skeleton that we saw in Second Sun. I think the Neon Dash looks spectacular in this game, and I believe the way Fetch disappears into a type of cloud of Neon looks much better than Delson's Dash, where it seems like he's still keeping some form. You may have also noticed that Delson's Dash in Second Sun didn't leave much of a trail compared to Fetch. Rest assured, the path you leave behind is much brighter and hangs around for much longer, leading me to spend an absurd amount of time drawing questionable images with my Neon Trail. The overall colors of the Neon 
Leon Super moves look the same, but that's expected. The new moves feel like they blend in well with the aesthetics of the powers that were established in Second Sun, and taking down enemies is an awe-inducing light show for those watching, and a satisfying symphony of lasers for those playing. I want to mention that, although your superpower is just a bright light, I never felt like the lighting got too crazy, unlike Second Sun. It's clear based on how much light is on screen that the game adjusts its visuals, however, for some reason when using the neon power, sometimes the lights on screen are so bright that it almost looks like an Ubisoft loading screen. I'm not sure why it happens, and this could be a problem only for me, but bottom line, it does happen. I want to clarify that as far as I know, and judging from the comments on the Second Sun video, this lighting issue I had when using neon was only a problem for me, so it could just be a quirk with my PlayStation where it bugs out when it comes to lighting. If you think that's going to be an issue here or in Second Sun, I can happily say that it won't be. As far as UI and menus go, it has a much more jagged look to it. The surveillance menu of Second Sun has been perfected in First Light, with things looking much cleaner. And this applies to the heads-up display as well. The icons on the map and the icons reflecting your power all look great and have a clean look to them. One thing that doesn't have a clean look to them would be Fetch herself. And that's not to say that the model looks bad, but it's to say that it's clear that she's been on the streets for quite some time. Her appearance is very layered. Her boots have what look like large feet warming socks coming out of them, which cover her torn leggings, which are also under her shorts. Following up, we see she has a sports bra, tank top, and jacket with a hood on it. Her clothing looks very warm, which of course would be necessary were she living on the cold, precipitating streets of Seattle. The designs of the supporting characters like Brent, Shane, who I initially thought was a young Reggie, and Augustine look excellent and also fit into the world. Fetch's animations look mostly good as her uses of powers such as the thrusters have a feminine look to them, and she hits the ground leaving a cloud of dust. She also drops to her knee, which helps make the drop feel more impactful. The way she drains Neon looks badass too, as she uses both of her hands and puts her chest into it rather than Delson who just used his hands. The way her jacket moves while she's running and climbing looks excellent too. Her climbing animations look better also, but her running animation looks a little off. My biggest issue with the animations and overall presentation is that her belt moves with her legs. I mean that for some reason, when her leg moves, her belt, which is sagging down, will distort with each leg movement. There's no way the developers didn't see this, and while I get that fixing it may have been much more complicated than it seems, why not just remove the belt? It threw off my focus whenever I'd see Fetch run. I also wish they had more options with the weather and daylight system. Once finishing the game, you'll get the opportunity to change the weather, and the different choices for weather are pretty low compared to Second Sun. I'm left wondering why they didn't let you use all the weather options from Second Sun, as the weather options in Second Sun and the weather options in First Light are the same. However, you can't play on specific settings like the Sunset Candy setting from Second Sun. Finally, and this is my last major criticism, they give you the ability to change your outfit between the regular outfit that Fetch wears during the game and the gear she is given at Curtain K. Even after you beat the game, you're not given the option to change your outfit during Free Roam, which feels like a weird oversight. On top of that, I don't know why they didn't let you use Fetch's outfit from Second Sun. I understand that these points could very well have been nitpicky, but I think it says a lot about the DLC quality when my most significant criticisms are as minor as this. That's pretty much all I have to say about the presentation, so let's finally see how the gameplay was changed. Firstly, let's look at the powers. One of the biggest criticisms against Second Sun is that the powers didn't feel fleshed out. Still, that criticism is thankfully alleviated with this DLC, as Neon has finally gotten the love and attention it deserves, and it shows. Basic Neon shots have basic upgrades, such as a rapid fire upgrade and shooting more Neon bolts in a single burst. Fetch's Neon capacity can also be upgraded to hold not only more Neon, but to drain the Neon faster. When it comes to light speed dashing, there's a vast difference that a lot of fans of the series, including myself, have been asking for. Eventually, when you're about 30 minutes into the story, these Neon clouds will appear around the map, and running through these clouds using the lightspeed dash will allow you to move much faster. These neon clouds are scattered everywhere, and you'll eventually get an upgrade that will enable you to retain the boost from the clouds for longer, meaning you can quickly get from one end of the city to the other at the speed of light, or at the speed of neon I guess. You can eventually upgrade your dash with an ability that lets you perform a jump out of it, and you'll also get up to two mid-air dashes, which allow you to get that extra boost when jumping from building to building. One power that is significantly different compared to Second Sun is your melee attacks. While in Second Sun your attacks are not only based around your chain, they also did didn't have much depth. While the melee attacks in First Light don't revolutionize the way you fight, it does give you a reason to use melee attacks. In Second Sun, you had no reason to use the melee attacks, because they were often too slow and weak compared to all of your other moves. In First Light, your melee attack is just your fist, and these attacks while still being weak are much faster and have a significant change. Finisher moves. When defeating an enemy with melee, you gain a finisher, indicated by the triangles in the bottom left of your HUD. And this is, much like all the neon powers, super quick and flashy. The attack can eventually be upgraded to cause an explosion that 
damages the target more and damages nearby enemies. This made melee a much more viable option as when I would play, I would melee a few grunts and once I had a few finishers stockpiled, I would save them until I was in a tight situation and to get out, I would use a few melee finishers, leading to a few enemies being defeated and the rest at least being stunned. I have to admit that there could have been more depth to the system, such as an even more powerful attack that you could perform should you save three finishers, but it's still a substantial improvement over the melee in Second Sun. The laser focus functions the same way it did in Second Sun, where you have to target an enemy's weak point, except this time the weak point is random. It could be on his head, arm, or leg. And I like this, as it makes the laser focus deeper than it was in Second Sun. In Second Sun, on a good playthrough for example, you would only aim for the legs, but in First Light, you're shooting all over the body. I have to admit that it's not a huge challenge to quickly move your reticle from someone's arm to their head, but it at least helps things feel somewhat fresh. Eventually, an upgrade allows you to, instead of killing your enemy through hitting their weak point, you can make them fight for you. Much like the other powers, further upgrades just increase damage, or in this case, allow time to be slowed for much longer when focusing. The stasis blast is essentially the stasis bubble, but better. It sent the enemy back floating in stasis, and I think it was masterfully designed. My biggest complaint about the stasis bubble in Second Sun was the fact that the bubble sent the enemy flying on both the X and Y axis, making them in a way harder to hit than when they were on the ground. The stasis blast in First Light is a blast that sends the enemy flying back, so wherever you send them, they will always be moving on only one axis based on your perspective. This made the blast much more enjoyable and more practical, with further upgrades just increasing range and damage. Next, and trust me, we're almost there is the homing missiles. They function like you would expect where you fire about five neon grenades that home in on enemies and upgrades can increase the damage these grenades do and the number of missiles fired. Finally, your super move is the Neon Singularity, and I'm glad they changed the super move as they easily could have reused the Radiant Sweep. The Neon Singularity creates a black hole and by the end of the story you'll have an upgraded version that sucks in heavy objects like cars. I think the powers you get are intuitive as they feel familiar enough for those who played Second Sun to be within their comfort zone, however, I wish they had more meaningful upgrades. There were 35 upgrades in the game, and only seven of them changed how you used a power. The others were just your typical damage boost or increasing your neon capacity or adding more missiles. Certain upgrades like the finisher moves make melee completely different, and adding a mid-air dash and a powered up jump and a light speed dash changes the way you use these powers and allows you to do more with them. The largest tree that is tied with melee is the homing missiles, and every upgrade just makes the rockets do more damage, knock enemies farther back, and allow you to shoot more of them. They don't inherently change the way you use the power the same way the laser focus does with its upgrades. Having the upgrade for laser focus, which makes hitting a weak point refill your focus meter, changes the way you use the power even if it is situational. You now want to chain these weak point hits together to keep your focus rolling. Maybe have skills play into each other, such as having an upgrade for the missiles so that they now target enemy weak points. And if you were to then also get the enslave upgrade, you could fire out 11 of these grenades that turn an entire group of enemies into allies. Thankfully, one way in which First Light massively improved on Second Sun is through its missions. Second Sun's missions could be boiled down to just combat. Sometimes it was combat with a different setting, such as on Augustine's fort, but it was always combat. The missions in First Light are a little more exciting, and I feel like it ends up being more effective in keeping gameplay interesting. Some missions do see you just beating down some thugs, but one mission saw me hooking myself up to a neon source, making my neon shots feel like they are sniper shots, using fetch as a neon turret. Others see you protecting a truck while trying to take out other cars, which makes the level more complicated as you have to keep track of the health of the truck, as well as your own health. Now, these missions are by no means revolutionary and are still a little bland, but it's certainly an upgrade from Second Sun. As far as missions went in Second Sun, the side missions were easily the worst aspect of the game. There were specific improvements I had wished for, such as time trials and more complex blast shards. First Light fixed these issues by taking out the boring missions from Second Sun and reworking things like the blast shards. Instead of upgrading your powers through the blast shards, you use neon lumens, which are these thick clouds of neon around the map. And while they're never brain racking, they at least give you some sort of challenge. For example, I found one that was in the middle of the air, and it was too high for me to jump up and get. What I had to do was go to a building down the street, run through a cloud to get the boost, and then quickly run up a chimney to get some extra height so I could jump off of it and catch the lumen. These lumens give you skill points, but you also get skill points from the many challenges. Challenges include getting specific scores in the arena, saving a certain amount of hostages, and so on. They encourage you to experiment with the different powers and help you to use them differently, such as using the stasis blast to send an enemy flying off a roof. The race is to you chasing after a lumen and you have to use these boost clouds to catch up to it. Graffiti art returns, and this time is made with neon rather than spray paint, and it works spectacularly. They usually depict Brent and Fetch's relationship, and some graffiti is tied to the story segments where you have to tag a drug dealer's vans in order to send a powerful fluorescent message. I think the graffiti, while being less abundant, is more profound as it seems to have more thought put into it, like this one here. In most neon graffitis that depict Brent and Fetch, we see Brent being represented by the color blue and Fetch by the color pink. Seeing this graffiti here makes me feel like the woman with the wings is Fetch, who's being kept in check by the webs that are representative of Brent. He keeps her grounded and prevents her from fully spreading her conduit-shaped wings while also keeping her out of trouble. Not all 
of the arts are as deep as this, but they all have either a deeper meaning or just inflict the player with a wholesome, warm feeling inside, while also making you more sympathetic for Fetch, as you know that her older brother will tragically die. In each district, there's a police drone with a camera that you can hack into, which serves as a decent puzzle, and after that, that's all the side quests in the game. They're entertaining enough, and there's not a lot of them, so they don't get stale. As far as mission design goes, I think the missions were fun, with the last mission in particular being fun, however, setting a mission in the middle of a blizzard which has a lot of white wasn't too kind on the eyes, as having it mixed with your power of bright lights, you'll find your eyes straining quite frequently, and I often found myself saying, what is happening I can't see. You may notice that there isn't a karma system in this game, and this helps to make the gameplay feel freer, and it's nice not having certain powers locked behind your karmic rank. Finally, one of the most significant changes to the gameplay of First Light is the arena mode. This mode is a godsend for a game like this, and I found myself playing more of this arena than I did all the other side quests and main story combined. Bonus points for letting you play as Delson if you have Second Son. The arenas have two game modes. The first is Hostage, where a hostage will show up along with some enemies and you have to defeat the enemies before they kill the said hostage. Allow five hostages to die or die yourself and the game is over. Say you want a more traditional experience, you can do the good old survival mode, which just has wave after wave of enemies being thrown at you. I don't have much to say for the arena other than I think it's a spectacular addition as it gives you a safe place to test out new abilities and techniques. For some closing thoughts on the gameplay, I think it's similar enough to Second Son for it to feel familiar, but First Light makes enough changes for it to feel like a new experience. I just wish that there were boss battles like the ones we saw in Second Son. A rival conduit to fetch would have been helpful, however, I understand that the idea could create some problems with the lore and continuity of the game. It's not just Neon that gets some new development here as the story and specifically fetch as a character is expanded upon. To give a summary, we're shown Fetch in her cell at Curtain K, where she recounts the events before her capture two years earlier. One more job. It's all loaded up, let's just go. No, this one's the payday. Mm-hmm. How much? Enough to rent a decent place. <sighs> yeah? Yeah. Enough for a short-tailed Burmese cat. The plan happens to go sideways, and a local gang captures Brent. A guy named Shane sees you and helps you out. After you supply him with a bunch of guns, he reveals that he has Brent, and that he won't give Brent back until Fetch does some more missions for him. Eventually, Fetch deviates and ruins his whole operation. Realizing that he wouldn't kill Brent, and when she walks into the old theater where her boss fight was in Second Son, Shane drugs her. And when Fetch loses control, she ends up accidentally killing Brent. This drug trip scene was done well, and I don't have much else to say on it. I just thought it was neat, as it shows all of Fetch's biggest fears and her most repressed memories. The story the story is being told through Fetch as she describes it to Augustine, and after a major story point and a breakdown from Fetch, we're sent back to the present day for a while, and by the end of the game after killing Brent, Fetch, in tears and clearly on the verge of another breakdown, is given the opportunity to kill Shane. Being so emotionally overwhelmed, she unleashes a powerful attack that blows a hole in the walls of Curtain K. She struggles to find a source of Neon, and once she sees one, she absorbs it and blasts through a small army of DUP soldiers. She catches up with Shane, and she... I like the development Fetch gets here, and her story feels grounded while still being supernatural. Fetch has anxiety, or at least that's what it seems like, but Fetch's mental health is handled well as it doesn't define her character as it does in some other games. I like that they never flat out say, Fetch has anxiety, or make it some romanticized minigame. Her anxiety does not play a role in the story, however, when she has a panic attack, she develops a new power as a coping mechanism. It's not outright stated, but it's implied that she first got her powers during one of her episodes. I like that her condition isn't trivialized, and even the the way she describes her instance feels realistic. Those breaks from reality changed me. I'd wake up with new powers. It was like my body decided to fight, but my mind just gave up. You've been very forthcoming, Miss Walker. She says that if she doesn't have Brent, she can freak out, and never uses the word anxiety or panic attack, and I don't know man, I just really felt like this aspect of her character was well done. We also see the amount of care she has for Brent and how grateful she is for him, as she's so easily manipulated by Shane. Fetch has to hide her powers when she's with Brent and keep a low profile. Still, when she uses her powers, she regards it as being so much fun and missing it. Miss this. It almost sounds like she just relapsed, and gets an adrenaline high from speeding around, which plays well into her addiction and drug-riddled past. Shane, as a character, does a great job of being such a hateable douche, and his constant attempts to swoon fetch felt hilarious but also made me hate the character even more, but in the right way. I mean, I think you're supposed to hate the guy. The way he manipulates fetch felt good because it's not like fetch was being incompetent in this situation, in fact, she shows that she's smarter than the average bear in a lot of scenes. Augustine also gets some love in this DLC, as when we're not in the flashbacks, we get to see the 
the insides of Curtin K, and we understand that Augustine does really care for her so-called inmates, and the fact that she brings Shane to fetch shows that beneath her concrete shell is some semblance of a heart. I wish Brent had more to do with the story though. We don't see much of him, but I wish we had more time at the beginning of the game to play a few missions with him and get attached to him. His death does still have some impact due to how clear the game is with how much he means to fetch, but it could have had more impact if he meant a lot to the player as well. The story itself, while not being perfect, was a significant step up from Second Son. My only major gripe was that when Shane shows up in the end, Fetch loses it so hard and does so much damage that she blows out a wall in this maximum security prison, and multiple people within the radius of her attack, people which might I add are wearing armor meant to protect them from conduits, are knocked out. The guy in the basic jumpsuit not only survives, but is capable of stealing a truck and eventually running away while Fetch is barely able to walk. It just felt a little weird. You do, however, get to vaporize the guy, which felt amazing given he was such an ass the entire game. I like that they ditched the karma system, as like I mentioned in Second Son, it heavily hindered the story in Delson as a character. Delson in his neutral state was relatively deep, but once he had to start branching off into a hero or villain, it felt like two half-written characters. Without the morality system, First Light opens itself up to tell a better, more fleshed out story, with a more in-depth character that isn't restricted by a black and white morality system. Infamous First Light is, by my definition, a perfect DLC is it supplements the story told in Second Son well, while also having its own identity and quirks. The powers saw an overhaul that, while not incredibly drastic or revolutionary, was just enough considering this is a DLC. The arena and races should be a staple in future games, as I lost more hours to the arena than I did to any other aspect of the game. The story did an excellent job of fleshing out the world in the story of Second Son, and turned one of my least favorite characters from Second Son into possibly my favorite in the entire franchise. It is hard, however, to recommend First Light over Second Son, due to both games costing $20. I think Second Son edges out in being a better bang for your buck, and I hope that Sucker Punch releases a $30 bundle that features both Second Son and First Light. The flashy visuals and satisfying gameplay are everything you would expect from an infamous game, and the lack of a karma system allowed the story to flesh out its characters more and make them more complicated than its predecessor. Despite being a short DLC, it is a fluorescent light show that is worth every penny. Hey, thanks for making it to the end of this uh, much shorter video, or at least a little bit shorter than usual. It's kind of it's kind of weird that 20 minutes is now like short, but whatever. I just wanted to give a shout out again to our uh, our patrons: Lucas Yazavito, A B Pyrite, Ghostly Gaming, Howdy Partner, Frank Riff, Denzel Ritesh. Detective Pika, Tyler Medor, and Ashwin Sridhar. I really appreciate your guys' support, and um, with the, you know, support that you guys have given me by just, like, watching the videos, you know, donating through Twitch, and uh, supporting me on Patreon, I've been able to buy a new computer, which, uh, as of recording, is currently being built at a uh, local computer store, because I don't really trust myself to build it. Um, I kind of know my way around a computer, but I when it comes to a CPU that's like $400, I do not want to accidentally mess something up. I think it's just best to, cause it's 50 bucks to get it made for you and they do a stress test and everything. So I'd rather just do that. Uh, so yeah, uh, I also want to say that if you guys have yet to do so, you can check out my uh, Twitch. I stream on Twitch at twitch.tv slash that boy aqua. You can do a big brain mode. Come on. Yes. Ah! Oh, what's that? Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that was definitely worth it. Sorry. I didn't mean to. Like, I, I really did try my best. You can also find me on Instagram at ThatBoyAqua. And guess what? You can also find me on Twitter at ThatBoyAqua. So if you guys want to follow me on those socials, those will be in the description. And if you want some more video essay stuff, you can check out Nam12399. He has a video essay on Final Fantasy VII Remastered, and it is really good. It's really long, but it's really good. It's one of those videos where it's like an hour long, but it feels like 20 minutes. And so if you haven't checked it out, you really should. It's, it's good stuff. I also want to say thanks for, as of recording, 22,000 subscribers. That's like, God, I don't even know where that's coming from, but I appreciate it so much. And it's just so surreal. And I just, I don't know, you guys make me so happy. So I, I appreciate your guys' support and I love you guys. So with that being said, I'll see you guys next time. My next video is going to be on Batman Arkham Knight. And then after that, it will be an Assassin's Creed video. I'm not going to say what Assassin's Creed I'll be covering, but all I will say is that you guys are not going to like it. Uh, I'm probably going to lose a lot of subscribers with that video. So um, be prepared to hate me. <laughs> but seriously, um, yeah, thanks so much. Bye, guys.